Uh, let's go ahead and uh, get started. So I'm not even able to charge my car. The only announcement I have is uh, for those going to the meeting, both in the room and listening to me, we're going to have a dinner if you want to go both Sunday night and Monday night. Sunday, I already sent the invitation out. You should have received that. I'll, I'll send one out for Monday. Uh, by pure serendipity, the two firms sponsoring it picked the same restaurant for two nights in a row. So I told the second people to change the restaurant, you probably won't get a good turnout two nights in a row at the same place. So anyway, just a heads up on that. Uh, the other thing regarding this topic has become, you know, Matt Altman is going to speak this morning on angioedema, diagnostic and therapeutic update. This has become such a big topic, uh, I think I'll only cover or have time to cover part of it. For those who have been coming for a long time, a few years ago we had Mike Frank out here who gave a brilliant presentation. I'm going to try and get Mike to come back uh, in the fall, uh, perhaps to concentrate specifically a lot on type 3 of this, which is getting very confusing and difficult to deal with. So Matt, uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I did figure out it was a pretty big topic as I was uh, going through it. It's a pretty packed hour. I may skip a bit of it, but try to get through most of this. I tried to mostly cover, um, first off, no disclosures, uh, <coughs> some quick abbreviations, which are um, pretty self-explanatory, but in case you see them, hereditary androidema acquired C1 inhibitor. Um, what I'm going to do uh, is first just go through th three uh, quick patient cases that I've seen uh, personally, um, uh, just to get people thinking. Uh, I want to briefly review the definition and classification of angioedema. We're going to focus, obviously, on the bradykinin mediated angioedemas today. Um, briefly review the diagnostic testing, which has not changed greatly, and I'm sure most people are quite familiar with. Uh, and then sort of the, the bulk of what we're going to be doing um, is go through these landmark trials that have all been in the last three years, so everybody's familiar with them, has some sense of the efficacy of these drugs, uh, specifically for her her uh, hereditary acquired angioedema, or hereditary angioedema, sorry. <clears throat> and then I'll briefly talk about type 3. It is quite a big topic. There's um, a lot of interesting literature coming out of this, but uh, it's not going to be the focus. And then I kind of want to look at what's going on using these new types of therapeutics for other forms of angioedema beyond hereditary. Uh, <clears throat> as I think that's pretty interesting and it's growing pretty rapidly. And then I'm going to revisit those cases because I expect the audience to tell me what to do. I have to follow up with these patients in the next week and need some answers. <laughs> so, uh, so that's that. So the first patient, um, quickly, uh, and some people may know these patients. So this is a four-year-old little guy who... Uh, in the first three years of life, uh, has had recurrent episodes of a rash followed by angioedema, mostly of the limbs, uh, lasting for several days. They've been occurring every several months, kind of one to three months in frequency, and he did have one uh, very severe laryngeal attack that was provoked probably by a dental procedure where he had some local anesthetic injected. <coughs> His labs demonstrate uh, kind of low levels across the board, <coughs> a low C4, low C1 inhibitor level and function. And there's no history of uh, angioedema in his family. So the questions then are, do you want to work at, do any additional workup? What do you think the diagnosis is? And how would you treat this little guy? The next one is a 28-year-old woman who, uh, in the last year of her life, so uh, since age 27, has had three episodes of very severe uh, painful angioedema of the face. Um, She's been to the ER, she's got an FE and or antihistamines, hasn't really helped. They've lasted for about two or three days. Uh, she is on an oral contraceptive, but has been for a long time. There are no other medications, no family history. Uh, her lab workup is very unrevealing, so normal complement studies, um, normal tryptase, negative allergic workup. So again, the questions are, what else would you test? Uh, what do you think this uh, young woman has, and how would you treat her? The last one's pretty complicated. Um, a 65-year-old woman who's had a heart transplant. She's on renal, or she's on dialysis from renal failure due to cyclosporin. She started an ACE inhibitor about two years ago for high blood pressure. Uh, she's had severe facial angioedema immediately after that. Um, but even after stopping the medication, she continues to suffer from uh, more of these episodes, albeit a little less severe. <coughs> 
Um, she is on a number of medications, may or may not be related. She is on a calcium channel blocker of note. Uh, <clears throat> she's had a low C4, uh, but really that's the only finding. Um, her C1 inhibitor level and function are normal. She's had a normal C1Q. Um, she maybe got a little better with antihistamines, but still having these episodes. And so, and again, the question is, what else would you do for her? So I expect some answers uh, in about an hour. <laughs> uh, all right, so just very briefly, tissue edema, we all know this. This is uh, going back to second year medical school, Starling's equation. Uh, fluid in the tissue is driven by hydrostatic pressure differences, oncotic pressure differences, and then the permeability of the surface of the vessel that you're dealing with. Uh, and that's up at the start of the equation. In angioedema, basically, the defect is due to an increase in vascular permeability. Um, angioedema versus edema, uh, everybody knows this, but basically angioedema is because of this increased vascular permeability, permeability, which is why it's not gravitationally dependent. While we'll see it in the face, in the bowels, um, it can be asymmetric. It's quite quick in onset. This is in contrast to edema, which is due to alterations in those other two factors, the hydrostatic driving pressure of the fluid or the oncotic pressure. It's slow, and it's usually in gravitationally dependent areas. Also an important distinction, because this is how we make diagnosis of angioedema, so angioedema versus urticaria. Angioedema is going to be fluid that's deeper in the dermis. Uh, it's um, usually, in addition to being potentially itchy, it can be quite painful or burning. And because of the deeper location, it will last much longer than urticaria, so several hours to days, as opposed to urticaria, which will go away in 24 hours. Um, so then the etiologies of angioedema. Um, we have our classic mast cell uh, etiologies, which are allergic reactions, um, mast cell diseases, like we learned about uh, a couple weeks ago with Drew, uh, the chronic urticarias. This, the big division when you're seeing somebody with angioedema are these versus the bradykinin mediated. Um, in this case, the urticaria are pretty much universally absent. If you see urticaria, you should be thinking about mast cell etiologies and not bradykinin mediated. Uh, the pathophysiology here, as far as we know, is, and we'll go through it a little bit, is vasodilation due to bradykinin, uh, which is both vasodilation and the vascular permeability changes. These are your classic hereditary, acquired, and drug-induced, uh, as well as um, uh, potentially some of the idiopathics. There are other rare causes. Hyperdiosinophilic syndrome can do it. Urticarial vasculitis can do it. And then there are all these where we don't know the mechanism. Probably, and I'll touch on this in the end of the talk, some of these um, are due to bradykinin. But, uh, you know, we have a large, I don't know, just in what I've seen in the last seven months, a lot of people coming in with sort of idiopathic um, and there's a question of what do we do with those folks. So we're going to focus on that, the very kind of media and stuff. Uh, this is just a recent publication that came out um, uh, in the annals here that showed, you know, when you're classifying this, you're basically looking at the bradykinin kind of mediated versus the mast cell mediated and being able to distinguish those two. Um, so what is bradykinin? Uh, it's a peptide. Um, nine amino acids. Uh, its effects, obviously, are the vasodilation and increased vascular permeability I'd mentioned. It also, interestingly, has effects on sensory nerve endings and particular pain fibers, which is why angioedema can be so painful for these patients. Um, can also lead to hypotension. Uh, it was first discovered, as I'll come to, in the setting of circulatory collapse and sepsis, or uh, shock. <coughs> Uh, history, so I saw a great grand rounds on this about a year ago in Boston, um, and it's um, an amazing history of translational research where you started with a disease of unknown mechanism 100 years ago. People took that down to the basic biochemistry, discovered all the mediators, and then uh, have brought that back in the last several years to effective therapeutics targeting that. Um, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but uh, just for your historical reference, uh, over, you know, in the Late 1800s is when this was first formally described in the literature. Bradykinin was actually first discovered in the 1940s. And then there were a lot of landmark work done in the 1960s in discovering that the lack of C1 inhibitor was uh, pathogenic in hereditary angioedema. Uh, 
I didn't realize this, but actually back in the 70s, people started to experiment with replacing C1 inhibitor. But then the attenu attenuated androgens were found to be effective in that same time frame. Uh, a lot of key work done in the 80s and 90s um, linking the coagulation cascade, the complement pathway, and bradykinin metabolism, which I'll show you a figure of in a second. And then more recently, targeting that pathway uh, to develop these three new classes of therapeutics, which have come out basically in the last three years. Um, and that's so, so this is a, a schematic, a cartoon of um, what these pathways are. Not to dwell on it a lot, but you can see it's fairly complicated. C1 inhibitor has a lot of key effects in regulating this. Uh, it's believed that the initial inciting event for bradykinin production is when you have tissue damage, factor 12 is activated on the endothelial surface. Um, this effectively uh, will activate um, pre-calocrine to calocrine, um, <clears throat> which then cleaves high molecular weight kininogen to uh, kininogen and bradykinin, which will have effects on the uh, um, bradykinin receptor on the endothelial surface and other cell membranes. It also overlaps with, again, coagulation affecting plasmin and fibrin, and then C1 inhibitor separately, um, but related, has effects on the complement cascade. Um, this is not anything I want to dwell on, but people should be fairly familiar with this in terms of the lab or tests for differentiating these known types of bradykinin angioedema. So basically looking at C4, C1 level, C1 or C1 inhibitor level and C1 inhibitor function. And then we'll talk a little bit, if we get time, about the, the role of C1Q. Um, <clears throat> but there are no you know, market updates in the, the diagnostic criteria here. So focusing on hereditary angioedema, and here this is specifically type 1 and type 2. Uh, so it's on a, autosomal dominance, um, which is interesting because uh, um, basically you lose function of one copy of this gene, and you really need 100% of your C1 inhibitor to prevent these attacks of angioedema. Uh, that said, a lot of these cases are not from family, um, from a family history. There are at least 25%, it's estimated, that are de novo mutations, probably more. Um, it's frequently delayed in diagnosis. It can be many years to decades after the initial presentation. The prevalence uh, is sort of all over the map, <laughs> depending on what papers you look at, but there are at least on the order of several thousand cases within the U.S. Um, and then historically, it was quite morbid, uh, with a fairly high mortality, mostly due to laryngeal edema, before we had any useful therapy for this, because uh, you know our treatments like epinephrine really are <laughs> are quite ineffective. <coughs> so in terms of presentation, most of you know half of these guys present by age five three quarters by age 15, but certainly a, a number of them can present in early adulthood, which I've seen. Um, it almost entirely, and I'll show you a figure on this in a second, affects skin and GI tract. Those are the most common. Laryngeal is, is seen fairly frequently, but less so, and then the other sites are, are quite rare, or, or quite uncommon, I'll say. There can be a prodrome of an erythematous rash, which I'll show you a picture of. There are a variety of triggers that have been well validated, uh, notably trauma, you know, dental work, surgery. Um, H. pylori infection was shown to, to cause recurrent GI attacks. There are a lot of other triggers that we talk about. It's very questionable as to whether or not these are true, such as stress, prolonged sitting, standing. Um, there's a lot of conflicting data as to whether estrogens affect this at all. Um, um, it's not conflicting. It's universal agreement. Estrogens make these people worse. Well, I don't and, know. And stress uh, uh, is, is, is clearly for some, like that one lady who was in my office twice a week for a year over to the emergency room. She finally found a boyfriend, and I hadn't seen her for, for months out of the emergency room. And her mother died this last weekend, and she's back in my office for her narcotic shot at her abdominal pain. I don't usually agree with Art, but I think he's right. There were a number of papers that showed it was, and I think these were just case studies that showed it did increase attacks, and then there are a number of papers that show exactly the opposite. Well, the so, progestin has, a, has an androgen type quality to it, so progestin can protect the estrogen part. It's, it's, 
you know, it's hard to do a controlled double blind study on who's going to volunteer. Yeah, I, I didn't read all these papers in detail, but from looking at the reviews, there's there's literature each way. But certainly, a number of patients seem to be affected by it, whether it's universally true or not. Every time I have a woman who's on estrogen and presents, I clearly stop it. Yeah, and, uh, I, 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 I did the same with a patient. <laughs> You know, Bill actually prompted me to look into this because I made that same statement to him, and he said, I'm not sure of that. So I looked into it a few weeks back, and it's true that the literature is somewhat conflicted. In type 3, I think the literature is stronger, but in 1, 2, anyway, I'll, I'll move it up to the uh, likely known triggers. Uh, and then the key is these people really don't respond. Hey, Matt. Yeah. Um, I thought the H. pylori infection, the literature is kind of. Questionable. I, I, again, I looked at one paper on this um, and looked it up to date too, which basically said, based on that paper and some follow up studies, uh, it's pretty definitively linked. Whether or not eradicating H. pylori will make it markedly better, I think there was some question about, but that said H. pylori is very hard to eradicate, so it's hard to say whether or not you know, those people were appropriately treated. Yeah. Can I have a comment on that? Uh, but the, with regular urticaria, it's, it's clearly controversial that some people feel strongly with it. H, with C19H, it seems more dramatic. The patients who've had it, uh, uh, and it kind of makes sense since he has some injury to the GI tract when they present with severe abdominal pain. And you cl uh, clean it up, it gets better, but it still is testimonial. There's no controlled studies. Uh, yeah, I, I, again, this is rather focused. What I had seen was suggestive of it, but and it does theoretically make sense. Anyway, you can tell there's some controversy in terms of what all uh, triggers it, but these are the things we think about. Um, so no response with their traditional drugs. So this is uh, a recent um, study, a fairly large cohort, looking at frequency of attacks. So just if you look at the number of patients who will ever have one of these attacks, you know, everybody has skin attacks at some point. Effectively, everybody has GI attacks. About half of all patients will have a laryngeal attack at least some point in the course of the disease. These other ones are, are significantly less uh, common, but we think about them, you know, uh, cystitis or urinary issues and some of these others. Uh, just on a per episode analysis, again, half of, you know, episodes are skin, almost half are GI, and then a small percentage of the total episodes are, are other uh, locations. This is, I don't know how well that shows up, but this sort of annular erythema we talk about as a prodrome <coughs> to an attack of androedema. And then this is a you know, just characteristic picture of what uh, the disfiguring and uh, extent of swelling can occur with, with hereditary androedema. Erythema uh, marginatum. Yeah. Dermatologists like to have fun names for, uh, for what they see. Uh, so in terms of the pathogenesis, the mutation is in the C1 inhibitor gene, which is a peptidase inhibitor, um, so something that blocks uh, another enzyme from, from cleaving proteins. Uh, it basically affects all of those things I showed you in the cartoon, the complement pathway, the uh, coagulation pathway factor 11 and 12, um, calocrine being the key for bradykinin. The uh, exact mechanism is not really known. As I said before, it's felt um, that this is all, the whole cascade is started by factor 12 activation on damaged tissue, um, although that's never been definitively proven, and that that leads downstream to bradykinin generation. And that's, you know, a normal part of physiology. Anytime you have tissue injury, you're supposed to have that activated and uh, have bradykinin created. This just shows from several years back what the known mutations are in this gene, in the C1 inhibitor gene. The diagnosis, I'll just run through this. People are fairly familiar with it. Uh, low C4 is almost universal, but not quite. It's estimated about 90% will have a low C4 baseline. Um, it should be low in everybody during an attack. C1 inhibitor level is low in type 1, which makes up about 85% of the disease, whereas the function, so it's a, a expressed but non-functional protein in 15% of cases. A word of caution, you can't interpret these labs in the neonate, so up to about a year of age, because C1 inhibitor will be physiologically lower. We don't routinely do genetic testing. Obviously, you could. One time you might think about it is in a neonate. Um, 
or if you're doing you know, research or trying to publish on a new mutation. Uh, but we don't usually do it. The therapeutic strategy is, again, a fairly familiar topic. We think about prophylaxis versus treatment of acute attacks, and I'm going to focus mostly on that, as that's where most of the new therapeutics have, uh, uh, have been working. And then these are the traditional therapies. I'll touch a little bit on attenuated androgens, which I think is the most effective of the sort of traditional therapies, and then we'll talk about these three new ones, the C1 inhibitor, foratocyne receptor antagonist, and calocrine inhibitor. So briefly, uh, from the New England Journal, these are the traditional therapeutics that are out there. I'm only going to talk about Danazol, as it's the most studied <coughs> and uh, probably the most effective of these. Um, We'll talk about a, a little bit later about the side effects, which are numerous and significant. Uh, and we'll kind of see how effective these are and then compare that to the efficacy of the new drugs. Um, so Danazol was the cutting edge in 1976. Uh, I was able to go back to the New England Journal and, and pull this paper. Um, and I think people in this audience are familiar with this. This is Mike Frank's paper, um, which was markedly effective. And I don't think this has really ever been reproduced. Um, but Danazol is a modified testosterone, so an attenuated androgen. This was uh, you know, what we would now call a double-blind placebo randomized controlled trial. Uh, it was nine patients. Um, and basically, the way it was conducted was uh, each of these patients were given one of the either placebo or Danazol at an extremely high dose, so the maximum allowed dose. Uh, for a month or until an attack occurred, and then they switched onto another one. And they did this for at least 10 months. Uh, the endpoint was looking at um, when a patient had five attacks on placebo and zero on treatment, or seven and one, because they calculated the probability of that would be 0.05. Um, and uh, effectively, in a small group of patients, they showed this was, was markedly effective. So in that month period, 93.6% uh, of the placebo courses had attacks, ended in an attack, whereas in that month only one of the patients on, oh, only one of the courses of Danazol ended in an attack. Um, so if you got a separation like that today, uh, you'd be pretty, pretty happy. Um, adverse events were pretty frequent and I don't think really reflective of what long-term therapy is, but everyone gained a significant amount of weight. Every woman had menstrual irregularities, some of them fairly severe. In this short period, they didn't see any sort of virilization or what they call changes in potency, but I think those are pretty well established as long-term effects of this drug. Uh, moving to a more modern study of this, uh, so there was a big review in 2008 of um, the largest, basically, retrospective study of these patients. Uh, looking at 118, and basically looking at how effective was the drug and how frequent were side effects. Um, and, you know, you can see it was fairly effective. Basically a quarter, 23%, were completely symptom-free. Well, actually, before I go to that, I want to tell you it's a very heterogeneous study, so it's a little hard. The, the range of time patients were treated was anywhere from two months to 30 years. Treatment dose varied a lot, as did baseline attack frequency. So it's hard to kind of draw any firm conclusions on this. Uh, for any given patient. But on average, um, you know, a good number, a quarter of patients were completely symptom free. A lot were in the middle, and then, you know, a good number, um, uh, you know, about another quarter, 12.7 plus 14, had fairly frequent attacks despite treatment. Um, that said, the average number of attacks did go down quite significantly from 33 a year to five. Um, <laughs> adverse effects were very common. Um, uh, half of patients discontinued it, many of them for adverse effects. Uh, actually, seven of them had no efficacy whatsoever, so it's not universally effective. 78% um, uh, uh, had um, adverse effects, uh, 93 out of 118. Common ones were what we're all familiar with, weight gain, menstrual irregularities, <coughs> virilization, and the like. But then there are a lot of serious adverse effects, which we don't talk about as often, but uh, one patient had a significant myocardial infarction, one had a hypertensive stroke, one had a pulmonary embolism, all attributed to the drug, uh, or, or at least you know, uh, the drug was part of the, the rationale. So it's not a benign treatment by any, 
And if they assume that those were causal? Well, again, not causal, but these occurred um, while on the drug. And there's You're good reason. Like years, a lot of things can happen. Yeah, well, most of them, a lot of these patients were not on it for that long. And a lot of these make sense. And if you look at the frequency of these in that population, I think it, you know, they said this is higher than you'd expect to see in a background uh, population. Matt, is there data on there's not on danazole. One of the androgens is used in pediatrics. I didn't look at the evidence. Oxandrolone. Yeah, or, uh, yeah, stanazole. Oh, stanazole. Or, um, Oxandrolone is also experienced in pediatrics. They use it in kids all the time. Okay. Um, I didn't look at that evidence. I don't know. But I'd expect you to see similar side effects in pediatrics with those. Um, and you obviously worry about lifelong therapy with those in, in young kids, especially young girls. So, so that's been an effective treatment for years, but again, in the last three years, a lot of novel therapeutics have come down the pipeline, which we're going to focus on a little bit here. This is a simplified cartoon of what the New England Journal paper showed uh, and shows you where these drugs take effect. So obviously you can, in blue, replace C1 inhibitor, Red is you're blocking uh, calocrine's um, activation of or formation of bradykinin, and then uh, the probably easiest to understand downstream is to block uh, the bradykinin receptor with a cataban. Um, these papers are my my goal here. I think if you really want to understand each of these studies, you have to sit down and spend about an hour or more reading the paper. My goal is to kind of show you the main uh, primary endpoint of each one and show why it's so hard to compare these drugs amongst one another, because uh, the trials are so different, and also why it's very hard to compare them to uh, previous therapies such as um, androgens, but so that everybody's familiar with them. Yeah, Matt, before you leave androgens, it's always said in the literature, androgens work because they upregulate the production of this product. Yeah. And I've never seen any data that that's true, and I don't um, know why that idea came from. I think back in the 70s, I, you know, when I'd seen the historical presentation on this, they sh found in these patients, if you measure the level when they're on androgens, it actually goes up. I don't know. I mean, it's assumed to increase liver production of C1 inhibitor, I think. And it makes sense because these people have a single functional copy of the gene. You don't, you know, you need, like I said, 100% to fully abort these attacks. Um, but if you go from 30% up to 50%, you'd expect it to have some efficacy in diminishing the frequency and severity of attack. So uh, I think there's evidence for it. That's the purported mechanism. Just as another aside, Matt, um, so, I have two patients there, insurance won't pay for any of these recombinant products, and yeah. then we have a pharmacy <coughs> compounding stanozolol for us again. So if you have anybody that doesn't tolerate danazol and can't afford the new stuff, you can get Winstrol from a pharmacy that will make it for them. Yeah. I mean, that's all, this is a good point, and there's a reason to focus on androgens because these are all very expensive and actually not necessarily as effective as we'll see. Um, so I'm not trying to dissuade the use of, of androgens by any means, and it's good to know how to, to get those. Um, so these new drugs, so that we can decide whether or not we think they're worth the price. Uh, the first is, is Barriner. Um, so you're familiar with the nomenclature. This was the, you know, they all used uh, cool names for their trials. So this was the Impact One. It was a randomized controlled trial. This is in Jackie in the end of 2009. The main goal of the paper was to look at efficacy and safety of the 20 unit per kilogram dose versus placebo. They also had a dose finding component. There were about 40 patients in each of the groups, so you know fairly small. Um, and the endpoint, uh, and this is something that's going to change from trial to trial, as you see, but it was basically what's the onset of symptom relief um, up to 24 hours, how, how long until they had some symptom relief. The problem with this is it was very subjective. It just basically asked every several, uh, you know, a couple times an hour, how are you feeling? Are you any better? It didn't require that there be any sustained symptom relief, so they could be better, and then 30 minutes later could be worse, and that still reached the, the criteria for um, uh, improvement. Um, effectively, they showed you know, uh, a pretty good separation of the curves here. So this is just looking at the percent of patients who had some symptom relief uh, out to four hours um, with the high-dose Bariner compared to placebo. Um, and you know, a, a significant number uh, had improvement. 
the odd thing about this is actually a lot of placebo patients were getting better. And they used the median time here. All of these used the median, which is odd. Nobody uses the mean, but I think it's because it makes the data look better. Because uh, once, you know, they had a lot where 50% got better, but a lot of them don't get better long out into the trial. So 0.5 hours versus 1.5, but again, just historical experience from what I've read, not that I've seen a lot of these patients, so people with no treatment should not be getting better in an hour and a half. Uh, they also, in the secondary endpoint, which was complete resolution of symptoms, there was a difference. But again, the placebo patients seemed to get better quite quickly, eight hours, making you wonder if the questionnaire they were using was effective. Uh, adverse events, which all these trials look at, were um, pretty uncommon. Uh, there were no adverse events such as infusion reactions that led to discontinuation of the drug during or immediately after uh, treatment. Um, there were at least four patients who had recurrence of the exacerbation, I think, within 48 hours. So there can be a flare of the disease again. There were no virus seroconversions, which was one of the major you know, uh, things they wanted to prove in this paper. Um, so that's, uh, that's that. The other, oh, and then, you know, what these guys did was, uh, that was pretty effective, but they wanted to show an extension of this. So they continued on with 57 of the patients, and this was just an open label, basically, um, prospective study. They had over 1,000 attacks, um, and they wanted to find out what is the average time from uh, treatment onset to relief. Um, and basically, in these thousand attacks, um, in a half an hour, all of the, pa or, you know, the patients on average were getting better, um, which is pretty good and not what you normally see with this disease. Uh, and then complete resolution occurred within 15 hours, which again is odd if you try to compare it to the initial study where the placebo was better in seven hours. Um, but nevertheless, that's what uh, they saw. Do you want me to explain it? Uh, sure. <laughs> but, um, I, well, they said at the beginning of the text, since HAE paint attacks are collocated, come and go yeah. and wax and wane. And yeah. I think that's one of the things when the first I made the Baxter studies 15 years ago, belly up, is did an hour crossover with this collocate disease that things get better. And so, so it's hard to get statistical significance when you're looking at onset of benefit. Well, that, that's get false data points. That's exactly why I think the primary endpoint of this trial was fairly flawed, because it, look, it doesn't do that. And some of the other trials tried to address that. Why total symptom relief because that, that should be sustained. Why that was the case, um, you're right, it could be. I mean, these patients could say I'm all the way better and then will feel worse an hour later. Well, they start to feel better, with, and that's yes. just a lot of false data points. So for the primary endpoint, that's a, a definite issue. Um, and I think it's, again, why, why it's going to be hard to compare this to, say, some of the other trials where they look at sustained benefit. Um, but but certainly, uh, certainly a valid concern. Um, adverse effects, fairly rare, 5.4% um, of total attacks. Interestingly, and this is going to be a trend in all these studies, there are a lot of these sort of mild uh, infectious things. So a lot of patients after treatment end up getting URIs, nasopharyngitis, uh, and the like, which given its effect on the complement pathway, you would wonder, and, and you do wonder if long term we might see true infectious you know, complications of this disease. Again, no viral transmissions. So pretty safe. You know, seems to be effective. Um, Synrise, uh, a similar trial they called theirs Change 2. Um, basically the same thing, control, consider, uh, comparing Synrise to placebo. They had about 35 patients in each group. Theirs was a little bit different, so again, they sort of defined unequivocal relief, and the way they defined this was you had to feel better, and then you had to keep feeling better for the next hour. Um, and then they, if you, if you met that, then they counted that initial um, feeling better response. Uh, and then they also looked at complete resolution of attack at the secondary endpoint. You know, similar um, data, they had a good separation of curves um, over the course of four hours. Uh, again, they kind of, the data is a little skewed because the way they, they look at this, so what happened in this trial was at four hours, if they weren't better, they got open-label treatments because it was inhumane not to treat them. <coughs> so when you look at the median, all they can really say is, well, the, the treated group got better. The median was two hours. The placebo, we don't know. It was more than four hours. And we stopped monitoring because at four hours, we gave them all C1 inhibitor. Um, so again, it makes it very hard if you wanted to, for example, compare this to Barinard. Um, and uh, 
sort of similar for a resolution of symptoms. I think the more relevant part of this study and, and what the drug is now approved for is they actually did a, um, a prophylaxis uh, component. So they took 22 of the subjects who were having very frequent attacks, at least one every two weeks, and they said, what happens if we just prophylax these folks with C1 inhibitor? So the dosing is twice uh, a week, uh, every three or four days. They gave it for 12 weeks, and then they crossed over to placebo uh, or vice versa. Um, and they basically looked at, did the frequency of attacks go down? Um, that was their primary endpoint. They also looked at severity and duration as secondary outcomes. And this is their main figure. And you, know, you can see there is definitely a trend towards decreasing. They went from 12 to 6. That said, not everybody got better. I mean, there are clearly some patients here who had more attacks while on this prophylaxis treatment. Um, <clears throat> but uh, a significant decrease. The severity seemed to go down. This, again, is a very subjective <coughs> measure, so each of these attacks appeared to be less severe and appeared to be shorter in duration. Um, same kind of side effects. So again, we saw some of these. The things I found interesting were the fever, sinusitis, URI, a vaginal yeast infection, which were questionable as to whether or not they're attributed to the drug, but were more frequent. You didn't see these in placebo. You saw them almost universally in, in the treated group. Um, although you can't call it significant because of the small numbers. Uh, I think I'm going to skip through this one. This is only approved in Europe, but it was a similar trial. This is the recombinant. Just so you know what it is, it's made from the milk of transgenic rabbits. So there's some theoretical concern about anaphylaxis, if your rabbit sensitized or the like, although that's not been observed as far as I know. And they showed a similar separation. It was, it was very similar to those other trials, similar adverse effects. And then I didn't realize this, but obviously folks in the audience know it. You know, they've been trying to use this. This is 96, and even before that, people were trying uh, other formulations of C1 inhibitor. So that's sort of the first class uh, of drugs. The second one are the bradykinin receptor antagonists, which is just a cataban. Um, and uh, these trials were the FAST1 and FAST2. Um, this is a subcutaneous drug as opposed to C1 inhibitor, which is obviously IV. So has the appeal of being you know, easier to use, potentially usable at home. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it was um, uh, two trials in one publication, basically looking at a catabant versus placebo, and then a second, R, or a second trial of a catabant versus um, uh, TXA. Uh, and they were published together. Um, there were a similar number of each, each patient. And again, they basically looked at um, time to sustained relief, <coughs> meaning they had to have relief for, I think it was an hour in this study as well. And they used, they were the first, uh, this study actually used uh, metric rather than just sort of using a one to four scale. They had this VAS score, which is one to 100. It's much more graded, gradiented, and they basically said you have to have at least a 30% improvement in that index symptom. Um, so a little more. TXA Transactimic acid, so anti-fibrinolytic. Um, uh, so they were um, a little more rigorous in their outcome, I think, than those other trials, and I think they paid the price for it uh, because there was actually no significant difference between catabant and placebo. So in the FAST1 trial, I mean, this is their primary figure. And even though, even with a trend saying there's a trend towards significance, uh, there wasn't anything statistical. So they calculated the mean, median rather, at 2.5 hours for a catabant, 4.6 for a placebo. That said, in the fast two, there was. So they had two hours versus 12 hours. You could probably draw a lot of conclusions from this. Maybe the trend of clemic acid made them worse. Uh, they would start it acutely during the episode. Um, nevertheless, what, what the authors argued, and, and this is probably valid and, and backed up by another trial, they did a post hoc analysis and they said, well, you know, a lot of these patients in the placebo group ended up getting a catabant because of severity of symptoms. So um, basically, with all of these protocols, it's inhumane not to treat patients. So if they didn't have improvement early on, within after four hours, there was an ability to get rescue medication, in this case, rescue a cataban. So a lot of these placebo patients, not immediately, but early in, on in the course of the illness, were treated. And the and authors are kind of in the study after having rescued. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're still involved in the study. So they, met, they follow them out long term. Now this, 
Yeah, I mean, this you can't see on this scale, um, but you know, 12 hours they were saying, well, you know, almost half of the placebo patients ended up getting treatment. That said, within the first 12 hours, a lot of placebo patients got better or had some relief of symptoms. And there was a lot of difference between abdominal people with abdominal pain from the FAST1 to FAST2. FAST1 had a lot more of the colicky abdominal pain, which waxes and wanes. Right. So, so that was... Yeah, that is true compared to more of extremity attacks, and they also had laryngeal attacks here. Both of those are more objective, and you know, a patient can kind of see. Um, so what, what the makers of the drug did was they went back and said, well, we, we think we can still prove this. Oh, I'm sorry. So adverse events uh, are much more common than this. So first off, pretty much everybody gets an, for a, an injection site reaction. And in the subsequent trials, you'll see it's 100%. And these can be pretty painful. They're large, erythematous, painful injection reactions is, is how they're reported. Um, recurrent angioedema was not uncommon, so this is a short-acting drug. It has a half-life of about two hours, um, and they did see a lot of folks uh, seem to have a recurrence, although it was not significantly different from placebo. And you get the same sort of nonspecific infectious symptoms uh, with this drug as well. Um, a couple of patients did seem to have LFT changes and or CK changes, making you wonder in a larger study, are we going to see liver issues with the drug? Anyway, they followed this up and said, well, there was no benefit, let's try again, let's change our endpoints, um, change how we do the, the trial. So it was the same thing comparing Cataban to placebo. And here they basically said, okay, you have to have a 50% reduction in symptoms. We're not just going to look at initial symptom relief. They also excluded laryngeal attacks here with the idea that you wouldn't have to treat people if they were, refract if they were on placebo. You wouldn't have to use open-label rescue medication because it's not life-threatening. So they can delay that. <clears throat> um, and here they got the results they wanted. You know, there was a, a figure that looked great. Um, uh, basically, here they were saying there was a 50% reduction within two hours uh, as the median, which compared to their first trial is pretty marked and um, uh, nowhere near as good with the placebo-treated patient. Same issues with uh, adverse events. So 100% had an injection site reaction. Um, and again, a number of these uh, infectious type things, sinusitis, UTI, uh, following, you know, in, the, in the weeks following treatment. And another case of elevated LFTs. Um, the last one, uh, and I know that these trials when I was going through them, this is when I started to completely wear out. They all start to blur together. But just, again, to make you familiar with them. And I think that evidence for this one uh, is probably the weakest. Um, this is a Calentide. <laughs> Their trials were the edema 3 and the edema 4. Again, this is a, uh, a protein. It's made in yeast. Um, it's larger than a catamant. It's a 60 amino acid protein. There is a theoretical risk of anaphylaxis. Uh, it's also given subcutaneously. Um, and here they had completely different endpoints from the other trials, again, making it impossible to compare across these trials. Um, but they looked at this treatment outcome score, which is basically, are you better? And they multiplied it by 100 so that they could have big numbers. Uh, and then they looked at, uh, as far as I can tell, I mean, these are all statistical tricks. This is, this is what they do. Not to say that they're not good studies, but um, they try to make their, their numbers look appealing. Um, and then as a second one, they use this uh, symptom complex severity score, which is the opposite. Negative is good as opposed to positive. And this was their primary figure. They argued that this is, or, or by the statistics, this is significant. I think if you just look at the figure, um, it's not very convincing. I mean, you know, again, zero is no change. 50, 50 is good, 100 is, is really good. Basically, your entire index symptom has resolved. This is at the four hour point. Um, basically, based on the fact that they had enough patients up here uh, and enough placebos down here, this was statistically significant, even though the medians that they are doing, even the means, overlap. Um, but using this statistic, it, it reaches a p-value less than 0.05. It um, works about the same. They're both all equally effective. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is, a, this is one of the big questions. There's no way to tell because you can't compare these. I've treated hundreds of these attacks. They're yeah. all about equal. Anecdotally, and I think all of the, you know, the authors argue in some of the reviews of these trying to compare them that it would be nice to have some 
comparisons. And, and you know, what it does come down to, you're right, is what's going to work best for the patient practically? Do they have any comorbidities that might make you worry about one or the other? But they all seem pretty effective. Uh, so, yeah. It looks like both the studies used 30 milligrams. I'm assuming they did some dose response curve. Yeah, so that was the best dose. Prior to this, I didn't show these studies, but there was an edema one and edema two. And even before that, I think there were some other trials, which were basically dose finding trials. Uh, and, um, you know, this is what they had established as the most effective. So yeah. giving more didn't make any difference. These people, 30 milligrams gave the maximum benefit. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they looked at higher doses with each of these. And yeah, I mean, the one, the first trial I showed you had that, you know, they looked at two doses. And all of these, they had earlier, smaller trials find, doing a dose finding uh, response. Again, that, were there any kids? So my next slide will show that. Basically, uh, the only ones, so the Baroner had kids in it, only a small number, but enough that it did get FDA approval. And then Calentide went down to age 16. Oh. So those are the only ones you can think about with kids. Uh, there are ongoing trials, I know at least for Acatavant, with kids, but otherwise uh, not so much. So you're, you're kind of stuck with Baroner. Calentide has a study with kids also, ongoing. but in Europe they use it for kids all the time. Yeah, I mean, you can, I, I don't know FDA like regulations. Like the C1IH is in kids all the time. Since you're replacing what's missing, it's right. conceptual. And, and that's what we do with Baroner here, even though it's not sort of, there hasn't been, you know, there were a handful of kids in that first trial. Um, even though it hasn't been shown effective in kids, uh, it is used um, and it is allowed by the FDA. I think everybody knows this, but Sinrise and Baroner are the same product. Pretty much. Uh, They're made slightly different. Are they? I, yeah, one one is. From the Dutch uh, Red Cross. Uh, I think they're, they, they describe in the papers they describe them through a slightly different, basically purification technique. But for all intents and purposes, they're the same thing. What's the half life of the Sinrise in that prophylactic study that we did? Um, they used it twice a week. Yeah, you know they they obviously they must have done that based on some pharmacologic half life of it. I, I didn't actually look to see, but presumably it's on the order of days, uh, whereas these other ones are short acting. Last, it'll last about four to five days. Half-life is about 36 hours or so. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to dwell on these. They basically then did a second study. This was the, uh, uh, I know these are backwards. This is the edema four, where they basically got better data by reversing their outcome. But I kind of wanted to move on because I want to talk about these. Those are just so you know the studies. I kind of want to talk about these drugs in other contexts. So this is the summary slide, again, showing what's approved in pediatrics. So you can use Baroner. You can't use Sinrise, or you're not supposed to, um, as prophylaxis in kids because, uh, of course, the safety is not established is what the FDA says. Uh, at Calentide, you can use starting at age 16. Um, probably these will be approved in the near future in kids. Um, there is somebody in Spokane involved in the trial for Acatabant. Um, so in theory, somebody locally could get uh, enrolled. Um, just This is some of the, the sort of theoretical risks. But anyway, this is just a summary of, of those five things we went through, uh, the three different classes of drugs. Um, so type 3, again, we will have a talk on this, so I'm not going to dwell on it. But, you know, I'd heard a lot about this um, factor 12, and I just wanted to, to look through it and see how many reports there are of, of it. But basically, type 3 hereditary angioedema is a fairly newly recognized set of HAE. It was first described somewhere around 2000. Uh, it's felt to be fairly rare. Um, the largest published series is 138 patients in total, and these are diagnosed clinically and on normal labs. This is not through genetic testing or anything. Um, we don't really know the heritability of the condition, um, whether it's autosomal uh, or if there's some X-linked component. I mean, the, the gene we found is autosomal, but that's only in a small subset. Uh, and it's of quite limited penetrance, as I'll come to. A lot of patients with, you know, in a family will be unaffected. Um, it's very similar to type 1 and type 2. However, you get this later onset. So like that patient I presented in the beginning, it's usually in the 20s. Um, you have a higher frequency of facial involvement compared to GI especially. Uh, more females, which is maybe due to estrogen is the thought. <clears throat> and then 
you'll often have a remission for longer periods. Um, the diagnosis, you have normal complement studies. And then basically you're left excluding other things. So you have to make sure it's not medication induced, make sure it's not idiopathic, however you're supposed to do that. <coughs> and then they're supposed to have a positive family history, although that would exclude diagnosis of any de novo case. Uh, and actually, the idiopathic, they do give some guidelines on what that means. So idiopathic angioedema, in theory, should have or often have some response to our more conventional therapies, whereas HAE -E -E type 3 should not. So these folks really have no response to antihistamines or epi. So what we know about the factor 12 gene, um, so it's on exon 9. Uh, basically, they're on the order of... Um, you know, I think a couple dozen um, described cases. The first ones were in, uh, I think, 2006. And there were these five index patients in Germany um, who they all, I, I think it was two families, um, and they all had this, or many of them had this uh, single uh, um, amino acid change at, at 309. Uh, and since that time, those authors and a couple others have shown 10 additional patients with that, that same mutation. They also found an index patient with a, another mutation in the same location, and then a couple other patients who had a large or a sizable deletion in the same area of exon 9. It's thought that these lead to an activating mutation, that factor 12 is now hype, you know, is, is uh, overly active or constitutionally active, and that that leads to the pathogenesis. Um, it's been described in a bunch of different populations. Notably, as far as I can tell, nobody in the United States has had this found. So you'd get a paper if you uh, find it. Um, and uh, the interesting thing with this, as I alluded to before, is they found this same mutation in unaffected uh, patients in the same family. So if you sequence the entire family, I think there were uh, you know, two in this initial cohort who had the mutation but not the disease. And then they've also sequenced people at random. There was a trial or a study where they took about 100 uh, unaffected, unrelated patient, people. Two of them had this, this same mutation with obviously no clinical disease and no family history. Um, so there's been a lot of uh, theorizing as other things uh, that may, uh, you may have to have sort of a double hit to have the disease. So in three of these initial female patient or German patients, um, they found mutations in non-coding regions of other genes which are involved in bradykinin metabolism. So there's a theory that maybe you have to have a decreased expression of either um, this amino peptidase P or the uh, angiotensin 1 converting enzyme. And maybe with both of those, uh, um, you know, along with the factor 12 mutation, that will lead to uh, disease. But this has not been looked at in, in larger numbers of patients. So that's just a background. We'll hear a lot more about it, I'm sure, with our next talk in the fall. But you know, the question becomes, how do you treat these patients? Uh, and then you know, I want to talk a little bit about, about the other angioedemas as well. So not surprisingly, you know, these drug companies are, are trying the drugs in HAE and others. So classically, there's no response to epi. Androgens, I may hear other from the audience here, but the literature I looked at suggests that there's no sort of universal um, proof that it's effective. There are case reports of some success, but a lot of the experts in the field argue that androgens are not very useful in this disease. Uh, same goes with uh, transoxemic acid. Um, C1 inhibitor, you wouldn't expect it to be effective. There are two case reports of its utility in a peripartum period. Um, but beyond that, yeah. It makes all the sense, and that's just a lot of opinion, but it turns out some of these eight type type threes, it's a godsend, and, and it makes it, yeah, it, it makes it really interesting so, the function because the only way that would make sense is if there's some functional defect we're not measuring. Yeah, and uh, so so it's it's a really fascinating group, and it's probably a mixed diagnosis group. Yeah, it may be. I mean, there probably are a lot of type threes who have some other pathogens that probably in the mixed bag. And, I guess it's worth trying. I mean, if, if certainly in the people with the mutations, there's no proof of its efficacy. Yeah. Um, and, you know. I have about five women who I think have this disease. I put them all on Danazol, and they're all doing very well. Yeah. This, um, that's just my opinion, or my observation. You should publish this. <laughs> <laughs> none of them have had a genetic defect.
like I sent yeah. them all off to the National Jewish and they all came yeah. back normal. There's a question from the outside while we sure. have a break here. Somebody's asking, Drew, you might know, or there probably is no answer. What's the protocol in the UWER for acute treatment, or they even recognize this disease in the emergency room, or they just think it's so there's no protocol. Yeah, I think what you have to do is so the, no the drug companies will, on their website, UpToDate also has this, you can print out um, sort of an emergency plan that they carry in their wallet, and then you have to actually have the drug already prescribed in that emergency room. So if they live by the UW, you can prescribe Baron or to the UW, they'll keep it on stock for you and you can administer it. Same goes with the Cataband, I think. Um, so you basically have to have it there in advance. Um, so uh, I'll just run through this because we're about out of time, but basically the makers of the Cataband have been trying it in type three. This is obviously very small. It was just an open label, no placebo. They took eight patients with sort of clinically diagnosed type three. They treated 19 attacks with self-administered acataband, and they showed that at least for some of the patients with a median of 40 minutes, but you know obviously up to 12 hours, they seem to get symptom relief. Um, you know we do think this is bradykinin mediated; it would make sense. And then complete resolution uh, also in some of the patients occurred early on. Obviously, some of them seem to have no effect. Um, a number of these patients required multiple uh, injections, um, uh, but that's not entirely unsurpri or, uh, surprising given that this has a very short half-life. And again, you know, very common uh, injection site reactions, but no other adverse events were noted. Um, so there's that. Uh, this is just the figure from that trial, basically showing, um, you know, that especially with abdominal attacks. And you know, again, this may be more subjective, but there seemed to be a rapid relief, less so with laryngeal. Uh, this was uh, immediate relief here. This was sustained relief down here. Matt, before you go on, yeah. since there's obviously no treatment, what happens if you give these people fresh frozen plasma? Go back to the least expensive treatment option, which is only a few thousand dollars. If you give them, well, I don't know in type three. I mean. Fresh frozen plasma in type one and two is actually a little bit controversial because you're giving them factor 12, which is thought to you know, make, make, make the, the attack worse. In these cases, hard to say. Uh, Nobody even I, looks at it anymore. <laughs> I certainly, I didn't look for it, for evidence of it. I didn't see anything in up-to-date or any of the reviews I saw. Um, I don't know if it's been studied in type three. Yeah. So there's that. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about acquired. I'm going to skip through this and just show the evidence for treatment in acquired. It's basically the same thing. People have looked at, I'll move down here, uh, use of C1 inhibitor in acquired. And, and you'd expect, I mean, these people are theoretically have an antibody to C1 inhibitor, which is the pathogenesis of the disease. If you give them C1 inhibitor, it seems to be quite effective. So uh, in um, a number of case reports, so up here, there's no sort of systematic study, but a lot of people are treated with C1 inhibitor and seem to do well. However, and you might <coughs> guess this, some patients seem to become refractory to it, maybe because they have too much autoantibody against C1 inhibitor. And so again, the makers of, Bar of uh, the Catavant have done a small case series of <coughs> eight patients, and it seems to be effective. Uh, they basically showed rapid improvement in symptoms and sustained compared it to two untreated patients who had 72 to 96 hours worth of uh, symptoms compared to six hours. So this is something we'll probably be seeing in the years, uh, in the coming years, use of these drugs for type three, for acquired. I even found, uh, so there's definitely good evidence for its use in ACE inhibitor-induced angioedema, um, although again, uh, on case series. And even for an idiopathic angioedema, there was a case report of this one guy who has had, they've, they've now treated them for six attacks and seems to have a market response to a cataband for, for a quote unquote uh, idiopathic angioedema. So that's that. Um, we can, why don't we take some questions? I'll, I'll go through my summary, take some questions, and then if we have a second, we can go through the cases. So basically, we talked about mast cell versus bradykinin mediated angioedema as a big dividing point in thinking about this disease. Uh, we know the types of angioedema. Um, we know a little bit about the benefits and side effects of androgens. Uh, we at least 
are familiar with those uh, reviews of the three new classes of therapeutics and um, a little bit talked about the growing understanding of type 3. Uh, and finally, sort of applying those therapies to um, type 3 and other forms of angioedema, which I think, I mean, my experience has been we see more commonly than, than hereditary. So I'll stop there for the moment. All of the studies that you presented have uh, used symptom scoring of some form or another for the endpoint. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, with 30% placebo effect common, is there any other objective measure of efficacy that have, has been explored? Um, there, not that I'm aware of. And the reason this all started was the FDA basically gave approval and said, you know, when you start trialing these drugs, we're going to say it's good enough if you just use, you know, a symptomatic that, that was sort of uh, in the common type studies, they tried measuring abdominal girth and did and visu visually how swollen they looked. And I think it factored into your one of your multi symptom scores as you talked about. In some of these trials, they did have you know the uh, doctor assessed, uh, which you would think might be a little more objective. They're looking at the swelling, but yeah, they may have they may have tried measuring but they obviously did, but. Um, didn't find them effective or, or easy to reproduce. He did a really good job. This is a hard subject. Thanks. It's impressive to me all these years later, because I still use a lot of Danazol, and if yeah. you get the dose down to 50 milligrams once a day, yeah. in my experience, it's almost side effect free, even in women, and it's a whole lot cheaper than any of these new therapies. And it works for all three types of disease, as far as I can tell. I don't know, Art has a lot more experience. Along the same line with your dad's comment, is one of my patients is getting SINRA. I switched insurance companies, and they had an electronic medical record at the hospital where she's getting her infusion, so a new prior authorization was never approved. So now, a year later, they call us and say she owes $312,000 because she didn't get a prior auth when she switched insurance plans. So just in case you're not paying attention to what Len just said. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, this is a big problem financially. In one year, she's burned up $300,000 yeah. of Sinrise. Yeah. No, it's a very important. That's on the low side. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think every shot of a is, you know, $30,000 or something like that. Uh, 7000 yeah. What's that? Six, so 7000 Per the actual drug. Yeah, so. <laughs> so, Matt, I'm looking at the uh, diagnostic algorithm from the debate, and, um, you know, I always wrestle about the cost effectiveness of actually measuring protein levels in a patient who probably doesn't have this disorder. Yeah. And in, in the real world, we diagnose a lot of idiopathic patients. And I find it's interesting, they almost contradict themselves. So for all patients they're recommending C4 levels plus protein, and assuming they're all normal, then they say repeat it um, again during an attack. And so my approach has often been just to a C4. And yeah. then following this algorithm, I'd probably then during attack add the proteins if I find the problem keeps happening. Yeah. I think that's very valid. I mean, again, the estimates are that at least 90% will have a low baseline C4. And if you get a C4 during an attack and it's normal, I think you're fine. Because that has to be low. I mean, that's, that's basically 100%. So I don't think you have to. There, there are a lot of different algorithms depending where you look. Most of them do argue for measuring a C1 inhibitor, but I think you make a very valid point that you don't have to. I mean, if you look at the cost effectiveness of our screening tools, then yeah. you're probably embarrassing our hit rate for how much we spend on yeah. you know, all the idiopathic cases. No, that's true. I mean, you know, these are obviously rare diseases, and it begs the question of what are all these idiopathics, but... Uh, but that's the real question, it. yes. It is, and that's why I did throw out one last case report. I mean, what can we do with these idiopathic People are looking. One thing has to be said, the functional study using the Quidellis assay, done all the labs, misses about 25% of the type 2s. The chromogenic assay done at National Jewish can pick some of those up that had, at least, I think, at least one or two that missed all other screens that were picked up by that. Yeah. Let's answer the three cases. Yeah, so you guys can tell me. So this, the first one is pretty straightforward. I don't think you need any additional workup. You could send genetic testing if you're interested, but it's slow and expensive. He has type 1, clearly, due to a de novo mutation. Well, we have, you know, probably the, the, the easiest thing in this case is his cases are pretty infrequent. Yeah, the one severe provoked, just have Baron at his local ER. You know, you could consider long term androgen if you wanted, but I think it would be excessively morbid for him. Um, or you could try to get him in a study for pediatric academy so he has something at home. 
other thoughts or are certainly most people wouldn't give a four year old uh, an anti right especially with you know the mild disease he's had um, so this one is a little more interesting and I'm curious what you think this is actually a friend of mine um, so you know is it worth checking factor 12 genetic testing it would be a, a publishable case report is the first US patient I guess with it I think uh, is this type 3? I mean, she doesn't have the family history, which is theoretically required, but again, you're going to miss de novo mutations with that. Or is this idiopathic? We don't know what to do. Or should we stop her estrogen? Maybe that's causing it. It seems unlikely. And then would this be a candidate for off-label acatabant, recognizing how expensive it is? Um, I don't know if anybody has any thoughts there. I, I'm, it's not actually my patient. But, uh, but I'd be inclined. She's on to estrogen. Me. She's on estrogen. She yeah, has that, that that just stopped estrogen. estrogen. Yeah. Well, again, this is Bill and I went through this. You know, there's no evidence for idiopathic angioedema, and, and maybe this is type three. Um, but for idiopathic, there's no evidence that estrogens no. are causing it. It's so. one of those things you think of as pseudo allergen that yeah. sometimes seems to worsen things. No proof one way yeah. uh, or another. I'd stop estrogen. Yeah. So, well, I think she actually did that. I'm, I'm not actually sure if she got better, but. Uh, um, still begs the question if she has type 3, and that's just provoking it. Um, okay, and then this one is quite complicated. Uh, she seems to have ACE inhibitor induced angioedema, and I've seen this now a couple of times where people have frequent attack. you know, they stop the ACE inhibitor, but they still keep having attacks for several years. I don't know if other people have seen that. Uh, in Boston, I saw another patient with no, none of this medical comorbid history who kept having attacks, even stopping the ACE inhibitor. Uh, she does have this curiously low C4, um, but the other labs are normal. So should we think about acquired? I didn't go through that, but there is some evidence that you don't have to have sort of the low C1Q or low C1 inhibitor ant antibodies necessarily. Um, is this ACE inhibitor induced? Is it her calcium channel blocker? We want to stop that, but we can't because she has such hypertensive issues. Is it acquired? Is it idiopathic? Should we just keep going up on our antihistamine, stop the amlodipine, try a catapan? This is a murky case, but yeah. you know, I wonder, and I was wondering myself, you know, what's the relationship between dialysis and the bradycanin and calicrine? I mean, sure. It's a net in and out, if there's any change at all. I've tried looking. I haven't really found anything. There's a lot of mojo changing hands there. Yeah, but I mean, does that also explain her low C4? I mean, she literally has zero C4 on it. Most dialysis patients don't have that. Um, but you're right, is it? It doesn't seem to be related to her dialysis. It's not like post dialysis she gets these attacks, but you'd wonder. Anyway, so that's, that's that. If there are any other questions, I'm happy to stay around and keep talking. Good review. Good review. Good review. Good review. Good review. Good review. Good review.